been at a place in your life or one time in your life where it was very difficult and hard and you felt like it was the end? Has anybody ever felt that way? Maybe not physically the end, but your life just felt like it was coming to an end, like there was nothing good in it. Now, how many of you are still alive today? Oh, wow. So many of you. Let the Lord say so. Um, so how many of you came out of that season, though, and you found some joy again in your life? Anybody ever did that, right? Okay, that, that's a prime example that of not mistaking a chapter as the end of your story. Okay? Not all chapters are glamorous. Not all chapters have beauty. But not all chapters are detrimental, traumatizing, painful. Some of them at the one page changing your life can change everything. And I'm sure there's many testimonies about that. So last time we talked about that a woman who was praying and believing God for so many things and her husband ended up getting murdered in the mission field. And she basically had a very hard time. But what's interesting is that the enemy wanted to be declared over her widow, broken, sorrowful, to hate God, to resent the ministry. But the Lord had a different word over her, and that was author and world changer and that universities would use her book to talk about missions and her daughter would be raised in the same village where her husband was murdered and become a pastor's wife and raise children. So it's amazing, right, what can happen when we don't give up. Tell your neighbor, don't give up. Some of you here have felt the stresses of giving up, and you're just like, I just want to quit. Let me tell you this. When you're at that point, I believe grace turns the page, and there's something else on the other side. And so this whole topic is about the grace of God, which is his favor, which is, which is his unmerited love and favor and his ability to influence our heart in the hardest of situations. Have you ever been at a place where it was super hard and you don't know how you got through it, but you did? That's grace. And so what we believe is that grace turns the pages of our lives if we don't give up. Amen? Today I'm going to talk about something that may be very honest and real. In fact, I don't think I've ever shared on the subject ever. And as I was studying about it, I found it to be very offensive, <laughs> almost offensive grace. I almost titled it that because God is so graceful. Sometimes it's offensive. But then when you go to point the finger, you're like, oh, crap, I had the same offenses in my life and you can't throw a stone. So this story is not even so much something I'm preaching at you because it's going to get really real in here. So don't think that I'm condemning you. But if there's parts of this story that you can relate to, let it transform your life. Amen. Now, some of you may not be able to relate to it, but if there's ways that this person thought or they think, maybe it's something that you can glean from. But I want you to hold fast. It might get a little heavy before it gets light. OK, look to your neighbor and say, it might get a little heavy before it gets light. All right. One more time. I need you all to say one more time. Can somebody give me a cup of water really quick, please? That would be awesome. Thanks, bud. Um, all right. Here we go. Stories and chapters, installment number two. Write some notes. Again, I'm not preaching at you. At the end of the story, you're going to see how grace changes everything. Changes everything. Today I'm preaching and ministering to anyone who has made some bad choices. Anybody here has made some bad choices? Today is a day where you, maybe I'm preaching to someone who's done some really bad things. Anybody done some bad things in the house? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you. Terrible. I have the right people on the front. Aren't you glad they're leading, y'all? Talking to some people who have caused damage to many people's lives. Talking to people who maybe have secret sin that's so deep that you would never want it to be heard. Talking to someone here today who feels there's maybe nothing left that God has for your life. But I'm telling you, grace turns the page. I want to share a story about a man who was raised up to be a mighty king. In fact, this king would be known as a man after God's own heart. He won battles. He defeated a bear, a lion, and even a giant. 
This man is named David. He was a shepherd boy who was anointed to become God's chosen king over Israel. We're blessed by his stories. We're inspired. How many of you grew up thinking, man, David is the coolest guy in the Bible? Anybody? Right? You think, man, David, King David's amazing. He's awesome. Like he had a slingshot, right? And he did the thing. He's heroic. The Psalms are full of stories that are painful and sad, yet David cleaves to the Lord so tightly. It's like, wow, I wish I had a heart like David. But there's a time when King David was ruling and he made some choices that weren't good. And a lot of times we don't talk about this side of David who was very evil. How many of you know David to be an evil man? That's okay, because many of us don't know, but he, David had a side of him that was evil. It was wicked. It was dark. It was perverted. It was sick. It was tormenting. It was a horrible side. But guess what? So often we only know the King David side. And I think there's a peace inside of every single one of us that can relate to that. That there's some evil, dark, wicked things that maybe others have not seen, others do not know, and, and, and it unqualifies your life. But grace says something different. Grace takes the worst of us and prepares us. Grace looks at the wretches and God says, I can make glory out of broken things. Grace looks at shattered lives and he says, I can put something back together that looks even better than what it was. Grace looks at the darkness and says, because there's so much dark, my light will illuminate even more in them. Grace looks at prostitutes and, and drunks and drug dealers and homeless and every person you think is wrong and evil. And grace says, I have a plan for their lives. Grace looks at those who've been outcasted, the prisoners, the murderers, it's going to get real, the molesters, the drunkards, and says, I still have a plan for that. Grace says, I died for that person who hurt you too. Grace says, the one who abused you, I forgave them when I forgave you. And if they turn, I have a plan for them too. Grace will raise up a serial killer in prison and use him to be a Saul in the cell. Grace turns the page in every single one of our lives. And so let's read about this David. The other side of David. 2 Samuel 11, I encourage you to write this down. I titled the first point, Staying Behind. If you have to go anywhere, feel free. But we are going to rest in this word today. I'm on a mission, amen? 2 Samuel 11, 1, Staying Behind. In the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war... David sent Joab, the Israelite army, to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, someone say however. David stayed behind in Jerusalem. This is really important. This was a designated time for kings to go out. Someone say kings go out. That means the season of rest and enjoying the possessions and enjoying the spoil and the toil of the work was done. And someone helped me say this. It's time to go back to battle. Time to go back to taking grounds. And so that's like our lives. Many times we have seasons where we battle and then there's times where we enjoy what we battled for, right? But David, the Bible says it was time for him to go back out to the battlefield, but David decided to just change his whole mind and said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to go this time. Isn't it funny how the biggest falls start with just the smallest compromise? But don't you know, it takes only just a little turn to shift everything. 
We belittle our little compromises and we think that they don't have big effects. But honestly, you can go back and look at this is the moment that changed the history of David's entire lineage. And it just was staying home that day. Perhaps David didn't see this army as a threat. He defeated many armies, and the Bible declares that the Israelites destroyed them, which could be an indicator that he didn't feel his presence was needed. Sometimes we do the same thing over and over. We've won battles over and over. We've showed up to serve our church over and over. We showed up to be on our tribe over and over. Surely I'm not needed this week. Surely God doesn't need me a part of a ministry. Surely God doesn't need me to keep praying for my crazy family. I'm done with them. Surely somebody else can do it. And David decides... I'm not needed in this battle anymore. David didn't realize, and I encourage you to write this down, although he could defeat enemies in the public place with others, he was unable to defeat battles in the secret place alone. I'm going to say it again slow. Although David could defeat armies in the public place with others, He was unable to defeat battles in the secret place alone. Interesting. How many of us find ourselves in this very place? We often find ourselves disconnecting from familiarity. We find ourselves disconnecting from the place of consistency. We find ourselves disconnecting from predictability. We think, oh, because I know I'm going to show up Sunday. How many of you woke up today and knew that? Did you think that today what happened to you was going to happen? Say it loud. Most of the time, we flee from the things that are consistent, not realizing that inconsistency and predictability is protection. When God calls you to that for that season, it's more than just showing up for church, showing up to your job, showing up, staying single. We think it's just these little things. It's like I'm just going to keep doing it and nothing's going to change. But what you don't realize is what God is doing in that season. And David was supposed to be in a season of battle and toil. And instead of battling and toil and continuing to take ground, he decides to chill. And that's like us. We get tired of the same old thing that God just called us to. And we think, I'm just going to rest. I'm just going to chill. Surely what could happen if I'm not where I'm supposed to be? Surely what's going to happen if I just don't show up this week? Surely what's going to happen if I stop going to Bible study? Surely what's going to happen if I stop giving to the Lord? Surely what's going to happen if I just stop? Can't be that much. And this is David. And this is many of us. I find that many people that fall away from the church over the last 13 years that I've been a part of is because most of them didn't feel needed or they begin to entrust others for what God called them to do. I'm not probably needed. This person can do it. Yeah, they can do it, but God called you to do it. And and when he's called you to a body, and he's called you with people or a sisterhood, it means something for y'all to get together outside of here and to open your Bibles together. And what if you, which I'm just speaking, what if you guys are preparing the way for the next women who are coming? What if you started worshiping in your home once a week and you begin to shift it? The temptation comes to David when he's alone, when he has idle time. And you're alone in places you shouldn't be. You're in a place alone where God has placed you in a season to be with others. David was supposed to be with other people. And guess what he did? I'm going to chill. I'm just going to hang back this time. I'm going to keep it going. 2 Samuel 11.2 says this. Late one afternoon after his midday rest. What, 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 
What? We all want the midday rest. David's the only one that gets it. I can just imagine David. He ain't even been to war. He's been chilling anyways. And now he's used to getting his midday rest. So he gets up from his nice little midday rest and his little slippers. And he gets up and decides to wake up in the midday. I'm going to get up. It feels good. All meanwhile, his comrades who God called him to be with are out battling and fighting. And what's so interesting is this. Many times we think the people that are on the battlefield are fighting. What's happening is they're fighting and they're gaining grounds and dominion. David seems to be relaxing and living the dream. But what he doesn't realize, he's about to fight the real enemy. At least if I'm here, I'm fighting with you. At least if I'm here, somebody else is praying with me. At least if I've got to go to dang Bible study again because I committed, at least I can tell somebody today sucked. But when you pull back and you just want to chill by yourself, David doesn't know what he's getting ready to get himself into. So he decides to get up. It's a great afternoon. He woke up, went back to bed. He must have ate good. I'm just thinking... I'm telling you, i never seen David in this light, and I'm being honest, my heart was offended while pointing at myself. I've never felt so upset at someone. And David's like sleeping. David goes out of bed, and he's walking on the roof of his palace. Y'all see it? King David, nice curly hair, handsome, walking with a robe and slippers, and he's chilling on the top of his palace, modern-day California mansion. He's just chilling, you know, Drake doesn't got nothing on him. And he's chilling. He goes on the top of his palace. And guess what? He looked over the city and he noticed a woman with unusual beauty taking a bath. Is he wrong for that? No, he's not wrong for that. I mean, the lady's right there. He sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told she is Bathsheba. I find it interesting that her name is Bath and she was found in the bath. Isn't that odd? And she had she butter. It was not good mixed. Bad Sheba. So the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uh Uh-oh. Then David sent messengers to get her. He sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. Now, be careful, because at the end of the story, woe is you too. I forgot to tell you the title of today's message. You are that man. So, was David wrong for taking a midday nap? No. I mean, he should have been fighting. Was he wrong for walking the roof of his nice palace as much as we hate it and we wish we had it? No. Was he wrong for noticing a woman in the bath? Not necessarily, unless he tried to like scope. So no, he wasn't wrong for that either. Was he wrong for trying to find out who she was? No. I mean, you would have been happy if you were single that King David come out with a robe saying, come to my palace. Come on, y'all, quit playing. I'm not saying nothing would have happened. I'm just saying you would have been like, the king has summoned me. I've been waiting for the anointing. Don't play me single ladies in the house. There's nothing wrong with being summoned by a king. You'd be crazy to think you wouldn't be happy. Thank God my wife thought I was her king. Hallelujah. So he wasn't wrong for that. If he genuinely wanted to marry her and he thought she was great, he's like, man, I actually saw her. She's beautiful. I'm taking her out tonight. Like, that's great. What was wrong? What happened, though, is David began to deal with a battle inside his heart that he was not equipped to deal with alone, that he was not supposed to be battling by himself. God could have been working some evil out of David, but because he disconnected and thought, I'm not needed anymore on the battlefield, and I don't need to be warring right now. I can just keep resting, and he stays sleeping. He gets to this place where guess what was wrong? He defiled a covenant that God made. And he didn't care that the woman was married. He found out 
She was married, and guess what he did? He did not care. He still pursued. That means at this point, there is a lust and there is a perversion. There is something happening in David that he's not controlling. And guess what he does? He begins to go after your wife, your husband. The second thing he did that was wrong, he, was, he, was, he had betrayed and he was disloyal. Why? Because she was married to a close conrad named Uriah and a warrior in God's army. You want to know I know that they were close? Because David said that he walked out in the palace, he saw her beauty. That means he was able to see details. And let me tell you this, not just anybody got to live right next to the palace. Not anybody just got to be David's neighbor, only David's best. Only his closest got to be an eyesight distance. David loved Uriah so much and his protection and what he could do. He's like, Uriah, you're going to stay right next door to me. Betrayal. Disloyal. But this is King David. Awesome. Some of y'all are like, I don't like him no more. He better not summon me. He's a jerk. I feel it, y'all. Like, maybe not. He's a player. Mama told me about the players. He got perverted. And all of you are thinking maybe sex. I'm not talking about that. He got perverted. That means using something that's good and is twisted for the negative and the wrong reasons. What did he do? He perverted his authority. Now just keep following me because, again, I'm not preaching at you. Just, I'm preaching something that's going to help you understand God's grace. Because if God can have grace for someone this wicked, I'm trying to tell you here today, God has a grace to be released on all of our lives. And so David, guess what? He took advantage of his authority. If he was just a random guy, he said, hey, Bathsheba, you look good, girl, come on. woo Six o'clock, I'm the dot, I'm in my drop top cruising the street. I got a real pretty, pretty little thing. It's waiting for me. I pray for these heathens right there in Jesus' name. I shouldn't know that song. Pull up. Lord, heal us. He made us all sin. So if it was just a regular person, you think Bathsheba would have came down? Especially if her husband's Uriah, the great warrior. You think she's going to risk it all for Joe? Joe Dirt? You remember Joe Dirt? She ain't going to do that. But she came down because David perverted his authority and he took advantage that he had a place to speak in her life. He took advantage of his authority and he used it for the wrong reason. And he said, you come on down. And guess what? She's like, well, surely I'm being summoned. The king wants me for some reason. I better go. David, you can imagine God looking down. He's like, no, 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 no. You're misusing the authority. I put you in this place, David, to make a difference. And now you're using your authority to fulfill your lusts. This is King David. So he gets with her and he sleeps with her. Number four, he had a premeditated sin. Not only did he call her, not only did he make, make it known that she was married, he didn't care. And he brought her to a place where she would, he wouldn't be questioned. He would have been questioned if he walked into her house. But he brought her to the palace where he wouldn't be questioned. Misusing his authority. Premeditated sin. So guess what he does? He sleeps with her. Now the Bible doesn't tell us if she wanted it. The Bible doesn't tell us if she rejected it. The Bible doesn't say if she tried to convince him no. The Bible doesn't tell us if she tried to woe him on the bath. Some people think that. Nobody knows. So we can't speak against her. But we can say David was wrong. Now, number three, the effects of our actions. Keep following with me. 2 Samuel eleven five. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, She sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Some of you are like, he ain't getting me. He ain't getting me. I find it very symbolic that 
he impregnated her because it's just like us. When we sin, we actually plant a seed. We're impregnated spiritually with something when it's not dealt with will grow to be something of its own. Am I wrong? If sin has a place to dwell, it will grow and it will have its own nature. And it will become its own being. And before you know it, it's changing your very nature. Just like a mother who carries a seed and a child, they begin to want to eat some funky stuff. They're beginning to burp out some weird things. They begin to feel some pain in the back like the devil's kicking her. It changes the nature of 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 a person. And that's what sin did. It changes the nature of who you are. And so David gets word. And if that doesn't seem to be any worse, just hold on tight because it gets way worse. Is there anybody in the room that's heard this story? Lift your hands. If you haven't heard the story, lift your hands. Yeah, somebody's like, forget the rock boy. He's evil. In verse 6, then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. Who's Uriah? Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent for David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him, how's Joab and the army getting along? Really, David? And how is the war progressing that he's supposed to be at? Then he told Uriah, go home and relax. Anybody know what's going on? Huh? I don't hear nobody. Somebody says, shut He told Uriah, go home and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance at the guard's gate. Loyal, faithful. I find it interesting and strange that sin spreads. Isn't it odd that David summons Uriah from a place that he's supposed to be and he calls him into a place where he's at? In other words, David should be warring, but instead he was resting and relaxing and sleeping. And he calls this warrior off the field and says, go home and relax. In other words, do what I'm doing. Evil, right? And Uriah is like, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not going home. I'm right here in front of the guard's gate. I'm going to sleep on this ground. That's pretty powerful. David's upset. Everything's changing. So then guess what happens in 2 Samuel 10? When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked him, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being far away so long? Don't you miss your wife? Like, Don't you want to be home with your kids? What do y'all think of David now? Come on. He's a great guy. But be careful when you point that finger. It's going to bite you back. Just watch. He bit me ten times. I was really mad at David. I've never felt angry at someone in the Bible. I felt angry toward David last night. I told Bias, I feel offended. Like, but the heck am I offended about? I'm evil too. And then God got to it. So just watch. So what's the matter? Why are you being so long? And he's, he's like, my plan isn't working. So guess what? Uriah replied, the ark, which is the presence of God that held the presence, and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents. And Joab and his master men are camping in open fields. How could I go home and wine and dine and sleep with my wife? He must have picked up that David was like, hey, go have sex. Been away a long time. Because why else would he say sleep with my wife unless he's like, David, why do you keep trying to send me home to my boo? What's going on here? Some scholars think that Uriah knew and he wasn't going to cover David's sin. It's not said there, but that's what some scholars believe. It's why Dave, why Uriah picked up, I'm not going home. Why do you keep trying to get me to sleep with my wife? You're going to have to carry your own sin. It's not said, but that's what some people indicate. And listen, he says, I swear that I will never do such a thing. Uriah committed, I'm not going home, I'm not going to sleep with my boo, I know I've been gone, I'm staying right here until you send me off. Now imagine David is just like, what am I going to do? King David. Then David invited him to dinner. What's going on with David? Talk to me, church. Church. 
What? Yeah, what else? Guilt and shame. So now he invites him to dinner, and surely that's amazing. That's so nice. Uriah's like, man, David, gosh, David's invited me to dinner. He brought me home. Like, he's trying to let me go home. Man, I can imagine Uriah probably feels like, man, God loves me. God is doing a new thing in my life. Like, man, the king is calling me. He's inviting me to dinner now. But guess what it says? Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. How many of you heard of this story? This is David. <laughs> I'm going to keep asking. Now how many of you want him to holler at you? <laughs> Some of you are like, he evil. I can see it in your faces. Good, I want it to stir up in you. I want that anger to swell up in you because it's natural that it should. So David gets Uriah, this amazing man, and he got him drunk. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. Man, he got, could you imagine David just evilly plotting in his head? Oh, man, let's cheers to the boys and the Conrads. And David drinks. Man, again, cheers to everybody and what you've done for us in the kingdom. How much did David have to cheers to get him drunk? How much was David willing to be drunk to get him drunk? How much was David fabricating that he was close to Uriah, acting like he was his friend just to get him drunk, to go sleep with his wife, to cover himself up? He's trying so hard to cover his sin. He's terrified. You see, sin always brings disorder, but camouflages in flattery. It was out of order that David was what he was doing, but because it was camouflage and flattery, his motive was hidden. But flattery was not a compliment. It was a distraction while the enemy conspired. And the truth is the enemy was in David. Be careful for that Jezebel spirit that David was walking in. He was flattering to distract so he could plan evil. That's the spirit of Jezebel. Y'all with me? Okay, I told you we're resting in this. We're, we're getting there. We're almost done. Scripture tells us that David got so frustrated and so hopeless with his evil plans that we're not working. Guess what he finally decides to do? If it couldn't get worse, he arranged to have Uriah killed. What's interesting is not only did he arrange for Uriah to be killed, he was willing to let go of one of his child to be covered up. He was willing to give an error of God. In other words, Uriah, that's your son, that ain't my son. Could you imagine David walking around always seeing his son, but never owning him? Totally disowning a child. Could you imagine what Bathsheba would have carried? The shame of carrying David's child and Uriah coming home and loving that child like it's his own kid and saying, I love you so much, son. And in her heart, she knows that that's King David's child. And so the Bible says that he told Joab to station Uriah in the front lines where the battle is the fiercest. Then he had his men pull back. So that they would be killed. Not only Uriah, they had to allow a couple other soldiers so he wasn't suspicious. So not only did one man get killed, but many soldiers who were totally innocent got murdered on David's behalf to hide his sin. Sin affects many. Sin spreads. Sin touches children. Those parents became widows. Those wives became widows because of David. Not one man died. Many men died because of David hiding his sin. Many children were fatherless because of David. Perhaps if there were children. And here we are. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. She was sad. And what do you think David did? Let's take some guesses. Victory. 
celebrate, sad, time to move on. I wish, but that's not the case. When she was done mourning, David sent for her and brought her to the palace. And she became, key word, not his wife, one of his wives. Yeah, you're like, I don't like David no more. He ain't my man. I never felt it. I never felt the anointing. I knew there was a red flag about that rock. He wrestled with too many bears in his life. David, you would think, oh, this is the moment. He can dust his hands off, right? It's time to move on, baby. That was a close call. Ask God to forgive you. Move on. No, David still needed more. David's like, hey, yo, you know what morning? Come on, girl. I bet he felt heroic. Everybody thought, oh, man, King David, he took Uriah's wife. Man, Trevor, you're such a nice guy. I knew he loved Uriah. He's not going to let her be alone. You know how many commands he probably got? King David doesn't allow anyone to be a widow. What a mighty warrior David is to take his best friend's wife, to take her and to love her, to care for her, to, to nurture her. But oh, poor Bathsheba, she wasn't the wife. She was just one. And guess what happened? David brought her to the palace. She became one of his wife. She gave birth to a son. But the Lord was displeased with what David had done. <laughs> when we think we're getting away with it, when we think he don't see it, trust me, the Lord is not pleased. And guess what? He's not pleased with Emmanuel Sargent either. Some of y'all are like, get him, Lord! You are that man. Be careful. How many of you can feel something toward David? Just a little bit. Anybody? Kinda, he kind of wrong. How many are David? Player. Don't you know, you're getting called up right now. We're almost there. So he's living his best life. He got the girl he wanted. He covered it up. He probably feels good about himself for taking her. And then all of a sudden, he's just living the dream. She's another wife. He's enjoying her for that season until whatever. He feels she's used to her or something. And then guess what happens? The Lord decides to send someone to speak to him because clearly David wasn't listening. David's trying to move on. God's like, no, hello. You are not moving on from this one. Hello. And listen to what he does in Samuel 12, verse 1. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell him a story. I wish I had a chair right now. I just need to lean. A story. In other words, he wanted David's guards to be down. He wanted David to hear loud and clear what he is about to say. So the Lord has told you a story lately. Listen up. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get some laughs in this crazy drama story. There were two men in a certain town. This is David just sitting there like a mighty king. Just freshly married perked up, taking lands. The Bible says they destroyed, so he's got a whole new land to plunder. He's just doing good. He's sitting there, and the, 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 the prophet comes to him. He's like, okay, the prophet's got something to say to me. He's sitting there, and the prophet says, there were two men in a certain town. One was rich. The other one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arm like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived in the home of the rich man. But instead of killing the animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious, the Bible says. As surely as the Lord lives, Nathan, 
I vow to you, any man who would do such thing deserves to die. I'm reading the Bible. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. He knew the prophet was telling him something was going on. And so David rises up. He's like, he deserves to die. Watch what I, how I use my muscle. I will kill them. How stupid and foolish they are. And Nathan said to him, you are that man. And I heard the Lord say that to me when I was angry at David. I'm like, get him, Lord. He's like, you are that man. You are. And if you think for one second that you've earned something, you did it. You were an offense to me, an abomination to me, and hurting my people, hurting my children. You were that man. Yeah, but I didn't do all that. You didn't do nothing. You did nothing to deserve my grace. You did nothing to be saved. Yeah, but I went to church. No, you didn't. I drawed you to me. You couldn't repent unless my spirit touched you. How many of you gave your life to God feeling absolutely nothing? Or did he come and touch you? Did he save you? Did he remind you of his goodness? Did he? Then you did nothing. And God began to show me this grace that is so outrageously offensive to all of our knowledge. It makes no sense. It made me so confused for so many nights this week. Trying to understand how God is doing it. The Lord, the God of Israel says to you. I anointed you king over Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives. And the kingdom of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword. Because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. That day, everything changed in David's life. History shifted. And David's whole life, his child would hurt. They would have incest. One, there was rape. There was abuse. And his whole life erupted. His son tried to destroy him and take his kingdom. Everything was ripped. And it started because David stayed home and didn't want to battle when it was time to fight. When it's time to get up and do what God's called you to fight, you can't rest. You need to be. And so no one little choice is not just a little choice. It can shift everything. I don't want to go to church today. Okay. How many of you skipped the church and you blew it one day? I'm not condemning you. I'm telling you the truth. Where God has anointed you to be, you need to be. Because you can't do it alone. And David didn't think nothing of it. I know there's been many times in my life where my worst sins were committed when I was in places I shouldn't have been. Guess what happens? This is what the Lord says. Because of what you've done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes. And he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it in secret, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. In other words, you took one wife. Remember, David said, they must repay four times. He said, I'm taking all your wives, and they're all going to sleep with the other warriors openly. Humble yourself. I'm going to humble you because you have not humbled yourself. I will break you because you have not break yourself. And this is why. Because I love you enough to do it, or you will kill yourself. 
Don't mistake the, the, the wrath of God and the discipline of God as, as unmerciful. No, it is merciful of God when he disciplines us. It is God's grace when he corrects us. It is his saving when he exposes a sin. He's trying to keep you alive. Then, someone say then, David confessed. Well, I would hope so. Right? Now, how many of you ladies in the house would say, okay, now nah, he's saying sorry, I believe. No, you'd be like, punk, you just got totally right. I don't even want to be with you. God's about to whoop your butt. See, it don't, that sorry don't mean nothing to me. I'm out of here. <laughs> Lord, I didn't do it. He summoned me. I confess I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes. All of that had to happen. David had to find out he's about to be totally humiliated before all of Israel. His child was going to pass away. The Lord told him, your child won't live. Your, your children are about to come against you. And then David finally, after everything's taken from him, he says, I'm sorry. <laughs> My bad. And guess what? Here's where it all changes, and we're about to bring it in. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you. And you won't die for this sin. Grace. I forgive you. How many of you would like to hear all that torment, and then God just says, but I forgive you? And you're not going to die for this sin. Very prophetic that God was letting you know that even in the midst of the greatest abuse and the greatest misuse of authority, we always talk about Saul. David did just as much as Saul, if not more. Saul didn't kill people and animals because he wanted to keep the riches. David did a little bit more than that, I think. David killed people. David, David destroyed families. David plotted evil. David was selfish. And yet God looks to him, he says, I forgive you and you're not going to die for this sin. And I imagine in that moment, David's whole life changed. How could you hear so much death in your story and yet so much life? Yes, I am the sinner of all sinners, but he's forgiven me. How is there good news with so much trauma? Because grace makes you say, I was a sinner, but I'm forgiven. And even though I got a whole bunch of consequences in front of me, man, I got a lot of humility, a humiliating that's about to happen, but I'm forgiven. And I'm here to tell anybody here, you may have a bunch of consequences and a bunch of things you're going to have to walk through for things you've done. But you need to hold on to this word that grace says you're forgiven and God says you don't have to die for the sin. I took it on the cross. I'm dying for it. So don't live like you're a sinner. Live like you're forgiven and know that I will set your, straight, your path straight. I'm talking to someone here today. And here we are, bringing it in. This is called grace, and God wanted me to, y'all know I, I hit everybody here hard all the time, right? Y'all be thankful. Someone prayed for me to preach on grace, because I'm all about a change. So you're going to get one good grace message a year. So receive this. I'm almost done. Some of you came to the longest service in history, but oh well. Thank you. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Did, did David's action, be honest, make you at least angry, especially if it happened to you? Can anybody be honest? Raise your hand. I want to see it. Well, here's the good news, that Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth. 
Ephesians 2, 4, 9. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms of Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. (laughs) You have been saved because of grace. Hebrews 4.16, let us then with confidence Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. I'm here to tell someone today. I'm telling you, I know it. It doesn't matter how wicked, how dark, how detrimental your sins, how much you've traumatized others. Listen to me. God declared to David You're forgiven. He forgives those who hurt you. He has a calling for everyone who abused you. Who took advantage of you. Who hurt you like King David. Who took away from you like King David. He declares to even your greatest abuser. I forgive you. Isn't it offensive? He tells the worst of sinners to draw near to my throne of grace. So you may receive mercy and find grace when you need it. Every sinner draw near to me. I'll give you what others can't. So what now? Would you play something, Steve, for me soft, please? That orange, and just turn it down low. So what now? What do we do after grace finds us? If you hear nothing else, hear this last two scriptures and take it home. You ready for it? Titus 2, 11, 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us. Someone say training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Grace comes, it saves you, it changes you, but guess what? It trains you to begin to renounce every ungodly thing now. That's what we're going to do today. I know some of us are hungry here, but some of us are hungrier to say, God, I need, like, I got some things to renounce. Because if grace really saved me, it gives me the power to renounce every ungodly thing and worldly passions. You want to know if you're in God's grace, you're renouncing and denouncing the flesh and ungodly passions. If you're not renouncing them, you're not in his grace. Grace affects you so much that it makes you say, I don't want to no more. You don't know how evil you are. You don't know how bad you are yet. Because when you know, you're thankful to be totally exposed like David. Oh, thank God. You can take my family. You can take my child. You can humiliate, take all my wives. I'm just so thankful I'm forgiven. And if you don't have that posture in your heart, there's probably still pride there that thinks you did something to earn salvation. You somehow are doing so good now that you made it. Or those people are so bad, but not you. Yes, you were too. And even the most righteous person in this room, you are a sinner as well. And you did nothing for God's grace. You blew it. You were wrong. Your family were wrong. Somebody was wrong. And guess what? God said, I forgive you, and you're my child now. Romans 6. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Now that you understand, you're like, man, I don't want to do that. Of course not. 
since we have died to sin, and especially all you who's been baptized, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten when you joined with Christ Jesus in baptism? We joined him in his death. For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may live a new life. And here it is. Let's stand up. Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace, in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Today, you can have peace with God. You can let every, every dark thing you've ever done, every wicked sin, every imagination, every foul participation, every pain someone did to you, every hurt someone put on your life. So we're going to pray over that today. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Scripture says, draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and find grace. Today's the day. Stephen, turn it up. If you know there is an area and you sense it is time to renounce ungodliness, like un unworldly passions, or grace hasn't really become real to you, and you say, man, now that I think about it, I, I, I don't know if I've really received God's grace because grace changes me. Grace leads me. And if you're saying, first, before I do that, I want, I want you to come in. I want to make sure that I have you as my Lord and Savior. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open these altars because I'm telling you there's an anointing to del for deliverance. I know it's late, but listen, this is the place to be right now. God's anointing is here for you. You don't have to leave the same. You don't have to carry that wicked thing anymore. You don't have to carry even, even what you've done to others, what you've done to yourself, your own bodies. that's you today before we leave and you want to know that the Lord is your Savior I'm going to say a quick prayer with you and we're going to get you some resources raise your hand boldly, nobody's looking if there's anyone, if not, I'm thankful thank you thank you thank you thank you Jesus we're going to say this prayer boldly say dear Lord come into my heart be my Lord be my Savior I need you to save me. I need your grace. I want to believe you have a plan for me, that you've called me, and that you're encouraging me to come to you, even in my wickedness. I renounce and denounce my life, living for the enemy and myself from this day forward. I welcome your grace. Overtake me now overflow, overfill me now with your grace. I want to denounce it all. Worldly passions, ungodliness, leave my life once and for all. In Jesus' name. If that's you right now,